Sharia is a highly developed system of thought and analysis, but only the scholars of Sharia can really interpret and apply it. According to Islam, you have to obey Sharia too. We'll help you understand what that may mean. Last time we actually showed the tie between the Jewish Talmud and also Sharia and the connection between the two. Now we are going to take another deeper dive in relationship to all of that. And of course, uh, with us here virtually in our studios, our dear brother Lloyd DeYoung, who will help us unpack all of this. Lloyd, welcome back, brother. Thank you very much, al -Fadi. Honored to be here. Uh, yes, we will go further. I'm introducing these pieces. We will go into much more depth in all of these, the history, the development, the ties to the Talmud. We will go into much more depth in the future. And we ended here with the two divisions and the four levels of Islam, in the divisions into the Sharia and the Hakika, the esoteric, spiritual, mystical side. This is the literal legal side and the divisions into or the four levels of Ibara, Ishara, Lataif, Hakaik, and that lay Muslims are all on this level, the basic level of Islam, the first level, as well as the Quran is read and understood at that level. Now, I want to continue with the purpose of the law. What is the purpose of the Sharia right, and of the fiqh? So Islamic law deals with two broad aspects of regulation. There are laws that deal with man's duty to Allah, the ibadat, the five pillars of Islam, the profession of the faith, the prayer, the fasting, almsgiving, and pilgrimage. Now, all of this is generally dealt with first in the fiqh books. So these five pillars of faith, your duty to Allah, the ibadat, generally in the books of the fiqh, we'll ex all of these words will be described and explained as we go forward. Right? So these legal texts, this is generally dealt with first. Then laws governing human relations or ma'amalat or transactions, because everything is transactional in Islam. It's, it's very much transactional. It's based on effectively the law of commerce, commercial transactions. So these are marriage, divorce, and commerce. Now, ibadat is, according to the Encyclopedia of Islam, submissive obedience to a master. Notice, the duty of faith here is submissive obedience, uh, like a slave would be, and acts which bring the creature into contact with his creator. Now, notice, this is not a spiritual act. It is simply follow these rules, do these things, and this will bring you into contact with Allah. Remember, Muslims are at the lowest, lay Muslims are at the very lowest level, the Ibara. They are not on the Hakaic side, therefore they cannot have spiritual knowledge of Allah. They have to follow the rules. All of this again, we'll cover. And submissive means allowing yourself willing to be controlled, inclined or ready to submit, to yield to the authority of another, unresistingly obedient, unresistingly. Right? This is very important for us to note. Uh, yeah. Now, Let's look at Quran 618, Allah, the forceful subjugator. We're going to look at Ibn Khaldun. He was a very famous imam, very highly trained imam, and a very famous historian of Islam from 1332 to 1406. Quran 618 says he is the subjugator over his servants. So this is why a deen is subjugation, because Allah subjugates people. People don't worship him out of love. He subjugates them. Ibn Khaldun in the Muqaddimah, he's very famous. This is his magnum opus, says Allah exercises forceful domination over his servants, right? Quran 618. And it should be known, he says, after the removal of its prophet, a religious group must have someone to take care of it, obviously a caliph, to cause the people to act according to the religious laws. So he must force the sharia to happen. He urges the obligations imposed, not politely requested, imposed upon them. The human species, not just the Muslims, must have a person who will cause them to act in accordance with what is good for them. What is good for you is the sharia and who will prevent them by force from doing things harmful to them. Well, yeah, to go against the Sharia is harmful, and therefore you must be prevented from doing so by force. Such a person is the one who is called the ruler in the Muslim community, and that's obviously a totalitarian, violent ruler by implication here. In the Muslim community, the holy war is a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everybody to Islam either by persuasion or by force. Caliphate and royal authority are united. There is no separation between church and state. So that the person in charge can devote the available strength of the ummah to both of them. And it states here, the other religious groups did not have a universal mission. And the holy war was not a religious duty to them. It actually admits that 
holy war, jihad, is a religious duty upon Islam, but not upon other religions, unless it was for the purposes of defense. Right? So understand, they are not under obligation to gain power over other nations, as is the case with Islam. He states here very bluntly, Muslims and Islam is under obligation to gain power over other nations. This is the case with Islam. Other religions are merely required to establish their religion among their own people. Now, let's look at the sources of the law. There are two main source categories for discovering the law. These are the revealed or the root sources, the Quran and the Sunnah, which can include the Hadith and the Sirah, the, what they call the biographies of Muhammad, but really are the Gospels of Muhammad. Then you've got the practical sources, the ijma, the scholarly consensus. You have ijtihad, independent legal reasoning. In other words, applying your mind, using analysis to figure out what does this mean? How do I apply it to this situation that I've come across? And kiyas, comparison, analogy. We'll talk more about these. Now, ijma from the Encyclopedia of Islam. In law, it is the third, but in practice, it is the most important of the sources of legal knowledge. The ijma is the consensus of the major scholars. So it is the most important source of legal knowledge. It's a tradition being passed on, being the unanimous agreement of the community. And when they say community, they mean the community of scholars, really, which is then followed by the ummah on a regulation imposed by Allah. It is the unanimous doctrine and opinion of the recognized religious authorities. This this section here, this can be ignored. This is fixed. The ijma is fixed. It cannot be abrogated, cannot be annulled, cannot be changed. It is permanent. It was decided centuries ago, and it is done. Right. So notice it doesn't say the Quran. It says the ijma, the interpretation of the Quran by the major scholars. What is ijtihad mutlak in law, the creative act of ijtihad through which the founding imams, the four imams of the four schools of fiqh, derived from the revealed sources, a systematic structure of law. So they applied themselves, and then they came up with this absolute law. Mutlak is absolute. Let's have a look. Mutlak means absolute as opposed to restricted, right? So mutlak is absolute law. The Sharia is absolute law. Now, the four roots, the proofs of Islam. The proofs of Islam refers to proofs that mujtahids rely on when they deduce and describe the rules of Islam. What are these proofs? They are the Qur'an. This is the divine scriptural revelation, like the Torah was for the Jews. You have the Sunnah, the oral tradition of Muhammad, the Hadith plus Sira, the Ijma, the consensus of the jurist. This is the most important of these sources of law. The reigning opinion, that opinion has been set centuries ago, and this is what is really believed. The Qiyas, juristic, logical argument or comparative analogy. Deducing a judgment for a case based on similarities to a case found explicitly in the religious texts, right? If you do not find a case in the religious text explicitly that matches the situation you're dealing with, you then have to think about how do I apply this? That's when you're doing ijtihad. So there are some differences between the word sharia and fiqh, right? The sharia is revealed. It is eternal. This is like the Quran. It is revealed. It is derived from Quran and Sunnah, so there's some interpretation that's involved there. It is broad and general. It is not specific. Notice it cannot be abrogated. It cannot be changed. It cannot be annulled. However, the Quran is abrogated. Understand there are multiple kinds of abrogation. There are, there are types of abrogation you've never heard of within Islam, but the Quran can abrogate the Quran. This we know. However, the Hadith can abrogate the Quran as well. So a newer Hadith can abrogate an older Quranic verse. A newer Quranic verse can abrogate an older Hadith, and a newer Hadith can abrogate an older Hadith. So in fact, that's that's just getting started with this stuff. But understand the Quran can be abrogated by Hadith. Hadith can abrogate Hadith. Hadith can abrogate Quran. Quran can abrogate Hadith. Quran can abrogate Quran. The fiqh, the fiqh is understood. It is what we derive from, what we think, right? It is understood and applied. So you read the Quran, you come to an idea, you understand what happened in the revealed sources a certain way, and you apply it. It is derived from and constrained by the Sharia. It works within these narrow confines of the Sharia. These are narrow, specific issues, right? specific points of law, and it is, has limited adaptability. It's based on new information or perceived need. So there is a level of adaptability there, but the Sharia, this opinion of what, the, what these revealed sources say, that is fixed in time. 
So the scholarly consensus, the HMR for integrals. Now, have a look if you have an opportunity to download this. Links in the description. Have a look at Reliance B7.0 page. Okay. In fact, I need to go there now. So, um, okay, let me make sure. Page 22 to 25. Notice here, the superiority of the learned Muslims over the devotee, devotee is as Muhammad's superiority over the least of the Muslims. So the scholars are completely in authority. We won't have time to finish all this, but let me go on a little bit here. The learned, notice here, the superiority of the learned Muslim over the devotee is like the superiority of the moon over all the stars. So the learned imam, the mujtahid, is vastly superior to the learned to the average Malay Muslim. The learned are the heirs of the prophets. The prophets have not bequeathed dinar nor dirham, but have only left sacred knowledge, and whoever takes it has an enormous share. So this should explain to us that those who are the scholars, the mujtahids, have incredible power and authority within Islam because they inherit the power from Muhammad. Okay, and the scholarly consensus, I'll finish here. Non-mujtahids are of no consequence. The opinion of people who are not mujtahids, they are of no consequence. So what is the opinion of these scholars is found in the Sharia and in the Fiqh, and that is all that matters. I'll pause here, Alfani, and I'll let you continue. Wonderful, brother. And uh, thank you so much, of course, for doing this. Um, uh, I hope everyone who's watching this series is being enlightened uh, by the teachings of Sharia concerning various matters. And if we're still dealing with some technical terminologies, but I thought our brother Lloyd did an excellent job in simplifying what these technical terms mean. So if you hear any of such terms, at least the ones that we've covered, uh, hopefully you can use not only our video series, but even the references that are provided for you to go and consult and learn more about what they mean. Uh, brother, thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, people will benefit a great deal uh, from this particular series because this is a very important topic for people all over the world, by the way, uh, to learn about whether they are Muslims who are oblivious to what the Sharia teach or those who hear about Sharia, but they're terrified of what it might mean, or at least how they can interpret it. Or those who claim that uh, there are things in here that don't apply to Islam and things in here that apply to Muslims, and yet Sharia actually mm -hmm. will shed light on all of that. Uh, I'll leave you with the last word. Yeah, so it is obligatory to obey the Sharia. It is unlawful to disobey. And yeah, we... Sorry, I just lost my thought there. I lost my point. Um, yeah, sorry. And the final point is, I will come back to these terms. I will repeat certain things as we go and provide more context and then fill them in. So I will come back. It's not like we'll say these once and then forget about them. We'll come back to them. I will show you them time and time again in different contexts and applications. And I will show these terms and you will understand them as we go through. We'll come back to all of this and I will make this very clear for you. Thank you so thank much, you. brother. Appreciate you. And thank you, everyone, for watching. This is Al Fadi. God bless. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.